Well, just start the program. Hey, hey, you're in Hollywood now. Come on, you gotta, uh, you gotta get with the lingo. <laughs> Pete, you did a great job Saturday. Oh, thank you, Steph. Thank you're you. welcome. I haven't talked to you in really, so long. We gotta catch up. Perfect timing. It was no, perfect. No, I'm glad. Folks. Hi, John. Oh, I like that bear or that whatever that animal is. John Mayer, that is, you're my hero. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have some powerful folks here, John. So, so tri tribute to you. Yeah. There you go. Well, it's so yeah. nice to see people. Yeah, you guys. Here. Professor John Barkai. Oh, oh my goodness. Calvin Roberts. Yeah. Well, I got, I got, a, I got, a, I'm, I'm looking at a limited screen here. I got to, I got to start seeing. Judge Williams. Oh boy. Yeah. Andre, yeah. Andre Goma. Jack. <laughs> we should do this more often. There goes the meeting. Siobhan. <laughs> <laughs> you look like Peter Robinson. Uh, you know what? It, uh, he used to work here. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Hello, John. How you doing, young man? Oh, great. Very good. good. You. you look fabulous. You still don't look like you're 20 years old. It's really insulting. Well, I want to let you know that uh, my birth certificate, that they wouldn't let me get my social security unless I showed them a birth certificate. So I've, I've proved I'm 65. All right. No. Uh, <laughs> no. Hello, Bill. Great. Wow. Great, great. John, I got, got it. Nice here too. Yeah. This is a great turnout. Barbara, nice to see you. Oh, yes. Uh, Jeff Truman, good to see you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I stopped the screen share so we can all see each other for a second. <laughs> Good, Beautiful. Beautiful. This, is, this is easier. <laughs> yeah, I was I was scrolling. Yeah. All right, um, Aparna, I think it's time to start. I've got. Great. I'm going to keep admitting, and you help me admit people in too. I see Great. Peter, Peter Riley coming in. Great. Did I see deep? Did I see deep showing up? <laughs> We're pulling out all the stops. All right, folks, welcome to our program today. You, uh, you'll have uh, none other than the man who needs no introduction, Professor John Landy with us. And I we are so gonna say that was Peter Robinson was the man who needed no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> we can debate over that in a minute. Yeah, they wouldn't show up for me, John. They wouldn't show up for me. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we have our students coming up too. Um, from 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 Africa. There you go. So one, um, Aparna. So we we are very excited to welcome. I want to thank Aparna Gupta for organizing this with us, and Peter Robinson, my dear colleague, our dear colleague at the Strauss Institute, um, who's still doing magic for us in the field. And uh, we are so excited to have you all. Thank you for being here. So, so my job is to introduce uh, Professor Landy very briefly, and then. I will leave it over to Peter Robinson, who is going to share a story with you to begin with. How cool is that? We're going to start with a story. And after the story, we're going to get some Q&A with uh, John Landy. Uh, folks, we'll try our best to make it a conversation and not just a lecture. Um, uh, John has been kind to suggest that to us. And I, we see a lot of our friends, a lot of teachers, thinkers, trainers in the field. Uh, we appreciate all your presence here. It is, it is being recorded, as you can see. So if you need a recording afterwards, let us know. If uh, Professor Landy has no objection, we'll share it. So oh, allow me to... <laughs> Okay, allow me to start very briefly with, um, um, uh, with, with our slide two here and uh, with Professor Landis introduction. All right, so I have, a quick, I have a quick professional introduction, then I'll do a personal introduction and hand over to Peter Robinson for the story that I'm sure you'll love to hear from. Professor Landy received his JD from Hastings and PhD in sociology from University of Wisconsin-Madison. Many of you know him, he is the chaired professor emeritus now and the former director of LLM program and dispute resolution at University of Missouri Columbia, my alma mater. And uh, before I go into my, let's keep talking about him. And he, you, you may not know that he was also the director of mediation program at University of Arkansas. And, and he has one of the most prolific scholars in our field who's done some amazing writing, especially in collaborative law, uh, in legal methodology, in thinking as a lawyer, as a new lawyer. 
He's received awards. He's received our section chair award from the ABA dispute resolution section. He is the inaugural winner of uh, uh, Mangano Dispute Resolution Advancement Award. And we're just so proud to have him contribute to our field so deeply and dearly, both intellectually and also from his heart and spirit. He's a terrific teacher, a very good mentor, and a very good, solid, amazing scholar. Now, personally, he has been my teacher. He is one of the reasons I'm in the US. Uh, Professor Landy made me the first phone call from US when I was applying for an LM student at University of Missouri. And, I, and he, taught me, uh, he taught me legal methodology, he taught me negotiation. And so all my students here, whoever is listening, if you don't like me, you gotta blame this guy, all right? <laughs> now it's an honor to see you back here, um, uh, Professor Landy, you, you've, been, uh, you've served so much, uh, you've served our field so well, and we're just privileged to have your presence here with us today. With that, I'm uh, holding it off to, handing it off to Peter Robinson, uh, amazing colleague to ours at the Strauss Institute, who also does not need any introduction. Peter. Well, in fact, be before I tell my story, Suksimran, I, I want to repeat one of your stories because another time when I've heard you talk, I think that uh, that first phone call with uh, with John, uh, you were still in India and your application <coughs> had been slanted towards the international commercial arbitration. And John was a professor in the United States calling and saying, you know, that's fine, that's good, but you know, the future is mediation. And, and he started to turn the ship even before you came to the U.S. Absolutely. He said, you got to buy getting to yes. I've said, I've already bought it. And he listed three more books. He said, buy these now. So uh, he, he was relentless in the very first phone call. You're right, Peter, back to you. Yeah. All right. Well, let me, let me tell you my, uh, my experience with John. Um, I want you to know that uh, John and I graduated from law school together. Um, and uh, so, so we, we were classmates and graduated uh, the, the same day. Uh, now John's about to challenge us about, about the future of legal education. And, uh, and I wanna let you know he's well qualified in my book because on the day that he and I graduated, I have a distinct memory about this uh, that, uh, that those of you who are old enough, you remember the movie, The Graduate um, and the, uh, the graduation party where Dustin Hoffman is mingling and an uncle comes in and says, uh, you know, the future and he says, I'm at plastics. Um, and, uh, and I wanna let you know that as John and I were literally walking out of the law school building for the last time, you know, I was off to some job in Washington in DC with the government and and John was and, and John said I just say hey John good luck where you know I'm not quite sure where, where where your path will lead but good luck and he said Peter I gotta tell you and he kind of ruled, he, he took his arms and kind of said said all of this experience you know this is this is a sideshow and then he said the future is mediation right now, I did not have a clue what he was talking about. Uh, I was not at all aware of even, I couldn't tell you what a mediation was, but, but all I said, well, whatever you think, John, good luck to you and God bless. And, and, and we parted companies. And, and then 10 years later, I ended up getting very involved in the mediation field, um, saw John at a conference or something and said, do you remember that day? And he looked at me going, what? Uh, do you remember when you predicted that, you know, this is, this is where it's all gonna be? And, and he goes, not exactly. And I go, well, I got to tell you, you know, I would testify to it under oath because it is a vivid memory of me. And he can almost prove that it didn't happen, but I still refuse to buy, you know, by, uh, by, by, by any, any, any attempt he makes to, 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 uh, to uh, disclaim uh, his, his prophecy. Uh, I believe, I believe it happened, my friend. So uh, I've been in his debt. He's been a wonderful colleague, a good friend, and, um, and just a, a wonderful leader in our field. I'm grateful that he's going to come share with our community uh, some of his thinking about, uh, about, about legal education. John, you're up. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and I appreciate the invitation. Um, it's a good thing that probably Peter is not going to get prosecuted for perjury because he said he'd testify under oath. Um, but I, the story is, is not quite right, but it's a great story. Because um, <laughs> um, when, when we had this alleged conversation, mediation was not on my radar. Um, so, I, I'm, you know, he was hallucinating again, but um, yeah. he's a great guy and a good colleague, and it's wonderful also to uh, uh, have Suk, who I thought was going to tell you that 
what the greatest thing that he learned from me was my photography techniques, um, which uh, <laughs> some of you know that I take a lot of pictures and I have a picture of every class I've ever taken and I can't demonstrate my technique, but um, it's one that is well designed to elicit smiles. And um, some of you have already experienced that. Um, some of you fortunately have not. So anyway, um, thank you for inviting me. I'm thrilled to see so many friends and so many experienced folks. Uh, they also lied to me that this was gonna be mostly students. So now all of a sudden I'm uh, really nervous, but um, somehow I'll get through it. Wonderful. Now folks, maybe request you to uh, turn on your video cameras if you can. We'll love to see you virtually. Uh, the way Peter, John, and I have uh, figured this today's presentation is just a Q&A and a conversation, if you may, informal conversation between the three of us. Peter, you want to start with the first question you have on your on your sheet, please? Well, and again, I, I don't know how much everyone's aware, but I, you know, I, I think the, the trigger for, for this conversation is that, you know, John has just, re you know, recently in the last six months, I think, you know, been a part of a team that put out a book that uh, really kind of uh, challenges a lot of research and challenges is, you know, um, uh, how lawyers help their clients. John, can you just kind of give us, uh, for those who, who haven't, haven't seen it and have, haven't seen the, 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 uh, the reviews, uh, just kind of uh, lay that as a foundation so that we realize what we're building off of. Sure. Um, again, thank you very much for asking. Uh, I co-authored a book with um, two wonderful colleagues from Canada, Kyle Keat and um, Heather Haven. And uh, they had done a lot of work on litigation risk assessment. And um, just give you another story here. Um, I am on the ABA publication board for the section of dispute resolution. And a couple of years ago, they said, you know, look for authors, you know, go to the, uh, uh, the conference. And uh, they had a session. And afterwards, I sent them an email and I said, this sounds interesting. Would you like to write a book? And they wrote back and said, yeah, we'd like you to be a co-author. And uh, although I had retired from teaching then, um, they, um, I thought about it for a short time and it was a wonderful collaboration. So um, I contributed the work that I had done on early dispute resolution. And uh, so the book is called Litigation Interest and Risk Assessment, Help Your Clients Make Good Litigation Decisions. And so it talks a little bit about uh, why so many People go to trial and get worse results than uh, the last settlement offer they received. Uh, their ethical obligation to provide this very challenging uh, process. There you go. Thank you, Jeff, for holding up a uh, um, for holding up. There you go. The cover of the book. Um, ethical obligation to advise clients, which lawyers know is actually extremely difficult. Then talking about one of the things that I think is one of the greatest contributions of the book is talking about the importance of eliciting information about clients' uh, intangible interests, which often are ignored or discounted or not reflected carefully enough in litigation, uh, client representation and negotiation and mediation. And then a framework for analyzing um, cases, looking at the value of the BATNA, also known as the uh, expected court outcome, as well as the tangible and intangible cost to develop a bottom line, which then helps in negotiation. And then the last section talks about how to work with clients, which of course is um, a challenge as well. So that's what the book is about. And then the way this session came about was um, I started to do this virtual book tour. Uh, the crisis came along shortly after uh, the book came out and uh, of course now everybody's on Zoom. And so um, I put it out there that I was happy to do talks. And so I've actually done a bunch of talks uh, lately and uh, Donna Shostowski up at UC Davis turned me on to their negotiation team and they set up a, a talk with me. And so, um, and they're primarily first year students and I wanted to let them know about the hidden curriculum and that, you know, there's so much focus on litigation, particularly appellate litigation, and that I wanted to let them know that actually much more of what happens in, um, in, in legal practice is negotiation rather than litigation and, and particularly appellate litigation. So that's where this all came from. Thank you, John. What, John, what does 
You, you mentioned in your book, Thinking Like a Lawyer, and you, you brought up again today the emphasis on thinking. What does thinking like a lawyer mean to you? Well, it means thinking about clients. Uh, one of the things that we talked about, you know, is this, and so I've, uh, it, it, that I've done in the, these negotiation school talks is talking about the hidden curriculum and the hidden curriculum, what is implicit in law school education is what it's really about is thinking about what appellate courts would decide and what, you know, and again, we have a very experienced crew here um, of people who know that the heart and soul of what legal practice is about is serving clients. Uh, for one thing, they're the ones who pay your bills. Um, also, you have an ethical obligation to advance their interests, to help them make decisions. And so thinking like a lawyer is, is com complying with your ethical obligations to help them uh, understand what's going on, uh, to uh, abide by their uh, goals and objectives and to help them make decisions about whether to settle or go to trial. So thinking like a lawyer is strategically thinking about how you can best help your clients achieve their goal, which may or may not be winning in court. Uh, often litigation is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. So I guess that's, I was going to say the short answer. That's my medium length version of the answer of what I think of as uh, uh, thinking like a lawyer. And John, Im implicit in the theme of your book and in your talks, as I understand it, is, uh, is kind of a, uh, I don't know, indictment might be too hard of a word, but, uh, but, yeah. but certainly a, a challenge to our, our existing and traditional uh, paradigm for legal education. Uh, if you could wave a magic wand and design a law school curriculum from the ground up, you know, what, uh, what, what, how, how would you like to engineer it? Boy, wouldn't that be great if I was king of legal education? Um, <laughs> and actually, I wrote a blog post about this, um, and I've, I've written a number of articles about um, legal education. Of course, it's not, you know, I, I'm uh, late to the field here. There's just a, a lot of company of people who've been criticizing legal education going back decades and hundreds of years. So, you know, this isn't original to me. You know, as I started to think about this in the wake of the talk that I gave um, to the folks at UC Davis, I was thinking what would be really good would be to have, instead of um, two semesters where you have students taking simultaneous courses, to start with a series of uh, modules and having students learn some basic things like written and oral communication, which just cuts across so much of everything. And then also, um, legal research and understanding the case analysis method. One of the things I've never taught uh, these doctrinal courses, but you know, I talking with colleagues, I understand that um, a lot of times they're saying, well, this is part of the, the value of using the Socratic method is that people learn about how to parse appellate cases, which is an important skill, obviously. Um, but I'm not sure that you need to do it in contracts and torts and criminal law and civil procedure that it would be a lot better if there was a concentrated course early on. So a sequence of courses starting with some modules about some of those basic things, then talking about working with clients or working with counterpart lawyers. Again, we've got obviously a very experienced crew here. Um, and so I'm sure that you all know that, um, you know, I've, I've interviewed a lot of lawyers and one of the things that people say is that um, you know, you tell me who the lawyer is on the other side of the case, and I'll tell you how it's going to go. If you've got a pain in the neck, it's your own private hell. If you've got someone who's reasonable, then you can work things out in a reasonable way. So part of it is working with counterpart lawyers, thinking about negotiation. And then I would have sort of in the, the second semester, um, focusing on... Uh, so all, all of that was one, one semester out of six? You're going to fit everything you just described with one semester? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't include any of these, you know, irrelevant things like contracts or torts in there. You're just <laughs> okay. focusing on skills first. What you would do is you would have, you know, maybe like in an intercession between, you know, the first and the second semester, you might fit in, you know, one semester course on contracts or torts or something like that. But you'd really focus more on these 
basic skills first. Um, and I'm being, I mean, you're asking what my ideal would be. Obviously, this just ain't going to happen given all sorts of um, barriers to change in the, the system of legal education. Um, and then sort of in the second semester, I'd be focusing on um, the practice areas. So one would be criminal area, another would be civil pretrial, another would be transactional work, another would be appellate litigation um, and focusing on, on those sorts of things. And then they would learn um, you know, some of the doctrinal stuff later. One of the things that also has motivated me, some of you may be aware um, of a report that just came out of the Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System uh, out of University of Denver. And um, what they, they reaffirm what, again, probably everybody on this call knows, which is that our system of legal education doesn't focus very well on the things that people need to know, that when lawyers go into practice, you know, all the things, you know, this memorization for these exams, these time limited uh, exams, uh, no lawyer in his or her right mind would rely on anything that they um, memorized. I mean, you're always going to look it up. Um, so memorizing all these arcane rules is just not very relevant and working with clients and getting the big picture and negotiation are things that are just so important. So um, those would be the things that I would focus on. And it's, it's not just me, it's, you know, a lots of people, including this uh, report that just came out. So okay, allow me to be a little provocative here, John. All you know, right. I see Marcelo here. I see my friends from other countries. When we go teach in Brazil, in India, in Japan, other places, a question that lawyers usually ask is, this is fun. This is good negotiation, mediation. This is cool, new thing. But I got to litigate. I, I need to pay my family. I, and why would I lose my case negotiating, mediating when I can make more money litigating? And even 30, 40 years later in US, we still have attorneys we both know or all of us know that still have the same kind of thinking. I can make more money litigating, why should I negotiate? If I put that frame of mind as something that influences our law students and that's why they don't want to take negotiation as a course, what would you tell them? Well, um, first I wanna do a shout out to my friend Tom Valenti here who um, you're talking about uh, students in Brazil and India, and, and he has put me in touch with some groups. And so I have actually done some of these talks um, with students in Brazil and India, thanks to Tom. Um, and I know that life is different there. Um, and uh, so we can talk a little bit about that. But just in terms of you know, the practice in the United States, why lawyers should consider negotiation. One is that, you know, in terms of their, their self-interest in making revenue, uh, there are a lot of lawyers who do, well, one, you know, most cases do settle anyway. So, I mean, it's a question of whether you're going to settle early or late in most cases. Um, and it's a professional responsibility to advance your client's interest and not draw things out longer than uh, they should be. Um, and in terms of the client's interest, I guess it's a framing issue. You can say, well, what are you losing um, by going it, by settling? And you can say, well, you're winning. You're 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 saving all this risk, all this stress, uh, all the additional cost um, of going to trial, where you know you could come out on the on the wrong end. So I mean, a lot of it is talking about what, what it's worth to them. And and one of the values of focusing on these intangible interests, and you know, I've just identified a number of them, the book goes into detail about more of them, but is that um, these are real values. So, I mean, if you have a client, you have a plaintiff who, you know, anticipates a, 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 a trial verdict of getting $100,000 and you say, well, is it, how much is it worth to you to settle now and avoid the risk and the stress and the uncertainty of going to trial? And they say, well, I'd be willing to take $80,000 instead. Well, that's $20,000, it's a value to them. I mean, some of them might be, you know, risk neutral and they'd say, well, you know, I'll take my chances. Um, or some of them may even want a premium. They hate the defendant so much that they're gonna make them pay extra to get rid of the, the plaintiff. So it's, it's a value, you're helping them understand what the value is. 
Now, thinking about situations in some other countries where um, settlement is not the norm, that's a real challenge. I mean, it's an even greater challenge. Um, so in some of these countries, you know, instead of a settlement, a, a trial rate of 1% or 5% as we have in you know, federal courts or state courts, there they have trial rates that are 80, 90% or more. And so it's a real challenge. It's not so much the lawyer's self-interest, it's changing the whole culture where the expectation is that you're gonna go to trial even though it may take literally five or 10 years to get to trial. Um, so that's a, a, real, uh, a real challenge. And it's, it's again, framing what it's worth to them and asking them what they want, you know, what is it worth to them? And, and is there a value in settling as opposed to, um, to waiting and going to trial? Thank you, John. I, I see a question in the chat, but Peter, go ahead first. Well, no, no, go ahead. I'll, I'm, I'm, I'll, uh, I'll stay in there, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you, man. This is a, this is a very interesting question by our, our colleague uh, from um, here in LA, city attorney's office, Shafan Roberts. And the question is, if I read, the courtroom is so romanticized in the media that it is often a strong draw for the field. How do you change or manage expectations for future law students? Uh, great question. Um, one answer is uh, ask them to go to court um, and, uh, and, and see, you know, I was actually writing another blog post where I, I had some language, which I'm not going to use there, but I'll do it now. I mean, people have this image. It's like, um, you know, the, of, of court from entertainment and news media that is very romantic. And it's like the highlight reel of a baseball game except if you're in a baseball game, you have to wait five hours or 10 hours or however long it takes to have that thing finished. And, you know, in real life, and again, those of you who've been in court, you know, being in court has all the excitement of watching, you know, a relief pitcher warm up in the bullpen. Um, it's, um, it's very tedious and slow. And, um, and they just have this very unrealistic expectation. So I know Woody Mostyn, uh, who's, um, you know, in your neighborhood encourages clients to go to court um, to get that feeling. And then part of it also can be a conversation with them about what it, their expectation is and how realistic it is. And, you know, a lot of it has to do with, you know, they have a friend or a neighbor or relative and they went to court and they got this great result or they think they got this great result, but they don't necessarily get the whole story. So I guess those would be some of my answers. Let me flip that. Let me ask the same question to Peter. Now, Peter, you've been you've been leading our institute. You have done so well for Strauss Institute for LA's mediation market and overall. And you're a terrific teacher. You've made mediation, you know, more. You, you're romanticized mediation, if you may. When you teach mediation, people listen to you, right? How how do you do it? And what's your answer? How do you how do we make mediation further um, bigger than it is in law school? Um, and again, Randy Lowry is, uh, is, is my attached at my hip as far as, uh, try, trying to envision, you know, how, how Pepperdine should, 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 uh, should teach and, and, uh, and advocate for, for mediation. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that we decided uh, at that time, there were lots of, of mediation training programs that, uh, that frankly were, um, maybe, Maybe right, um, but but they were very very different from um, from from what lawyers were used to, and uh, and 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 they wanted to go out of their way to say you know a settlement conference is one thing, but mediation is different, and and let, let, let's make sure that we differentiate between those two, and and the mediation needs to be interest based and not positional bargaining, and and all these different ways that we would um, kind of. Uh, 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 that the, the field might identify uh, what mediation was. And, and Randy and I said, you know what, uh, call the sellouts if you want to. Uh, but the fact is, I, I think that we were uh, realists that, uh, that why don't we make this e uh, as easy as possible for lawyers to embrace? 
Um, and, to, and to show the similarities between a, a settlement conference and a mediation, this is similar to, as compared to, you know, diametrically different from, so, so our thought was, you know, let's look at who our audience is, and if our audience is the legal profession, let's try and give them a version of this that, uh, that, 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 that frankly, probably has the foundation of the settlement conference with distributive bargaining and what have you, with other opportunities for people to tell their story broader and to, and to share the feelings and the values and, and, and suddenly to get into those interests um, and maybe those help lead to solutions. Uh, but, but let's not, uh, let, let's try and package the mediation process as something that the lawyer can kind of say, okay, this is not that different for, from, from, from what, we, what we've been doing with uh, judicial settlement conferences for the last 20 years. And around the world, you know, John, I, I've, I've, as I've talked to people, especially in Latin America, my understanding is that they don't have judicial settlement conferences in many of the countries I've talked to people. They have something called a conciliator, who is, uh, you know, just a half a step above a court clerk um, and carries no Panache and 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 uh, and that person does reach. In fact, I see Andre. Uh, you know, Andre. Am I, I don't know exactly Brazil. I'm thinking about uh, what lawyers from Mexico told me. Um, uh, in any event, uh, in the civil law countries that that uh, that that they they didn't have the platform of a judicial settlement conference to to build off of, uh, so the lawyers could say, "Oh, okay, I I." I, I I've been to something like this. This this is a little different, but uh, so in any event, that that's my that's my sense of what we did at Pepperdine to try and encourage the the legal community in in our region to kind of say, hey guys, this is a this is an asset. Don't don't uh, don't don't throw it don't throw it out the water. Throw out throw out the baby with the bathwater. I think I see Judge Williams is going to uh, going to going to correct me, uh, which I always love. <laughs> I thought you were going to be honest, Peter, and say that facts, <laughs> facts, facts don't matter to you. It's the story that matters, and and I understand that. Uh, it is such a treat to see you again, my friend. Can I offer three answers to three questions that have been asked very quickly? Number one, to the lawyer who says I'd rather uh, litigate, I would ask that lawyer, do you want the client for this case, or do you want the client for life? I think it's a very fundamental choice. Secondly. Sadly, with respect to the statistics of, of settlement as opposed to litigation overseas, I will never forget a conversation I had with a lawyer from an Eastern European country who said that one of the reasons mediation will take a long time to succeed in her country is that it interfered with the opportunity to bribe judges. So I, of course, asked where I could sign up to be a judge. <laughs> the, third, the third point I would make is with respect to the law student, she should be encouraged to be really good at litigation. Get out there, play the game, know the game, because she will be a better mediator for it. See, that was faster than Peter. <laughs> that was faster <that> <laughs> than all of us. That was a great answer. Wow. Thank you, Judge. All right. Um, next question, John, if... if Don't lawyers need to use law and, and, and they need to go to court? And how do, you, how do you manage that substantive part of your passion for mediation and negotiation versus the need to know and understand the law um, for the law school curriculum? Sure. Well, I just want to follow on to what Judge Williams said, which is that, of course, law is very important. Um, and... You know, if you think about the structure in this book of the three elements, one of them is the expected court outcome, and then the others are the uh, expected tangible costs, the legal fees and legal expenses, and then the intangible costs, then you need to consider all three of those. Um, and so if you have a case where there's a, a serious possibility of, of going to trial, you want to be thinking about that. And indeed, for, for practitioners, um, lawyers in, as, as, as advocates, as well as lawyers as mediators, understanding what might happen if you went to court is a, a critical factor in being able to give good advice to clients and give them, help them do their own assessment about what would be likely to happen if they went to court. And, and law actually serves lots of different purposes. It's a a reflection. I, I took my first mediation training from Gary Friedman uh, up the road a bit um, from you all, and or at least those of you who are down in Pepperdine. Um, and one of the things that he uh, pointed out is that law is a 
a reflection of our social norms. And, and so it's a default. It's something that if you can't reach an agreement about this is what society will choose. And, and there are reasons why society has chosen these particular norms. So the short answer to your question, Sue, and again, this isn't short, but uh, is that it is valuable on a practical level and it has normative significance. It's just not the only thing or necessarily the most important thing that parties should think about when they are having a problem, they're having a dispute and they're trying to figure out what would be the best way to resolve it. I, I, I'm gonna to go to Peter next, Peter, please. You know, John, <clears throat> even your book um, is still focusing on lawyers in the context of litigation. And, uh, and I think about my own first job as a lawyer uh, with the federal agency. I mean, um, uh, I was in the office of general counsel for an agency. You know, I was asked to draft, you know, a potential, uh, actually another department drafted a regu proposed regulation. They wanted it reviewed by the office of general counsel. It was assigned to me. I came up with about 25 requested improvements in the language of the regulation, right? And, and frankly, the general counsel loved it because, because, um, because it, it showed that the general counsel's office was very important uh, because we, we caught a bunch of mistakes that they made. But the fact is, then the two offices had, had to come together and talk about which of the suggested re, you know, requested improvements are they going to accept? And, which are, uh, and the fact is, is, I mean, lawyers, you know, I, I did do some litigation in my first job, but I would probably say 80% of my job was bureaucratic. Um, I, I wrote congressional testimony and other people in the office had to review it and, and, and they changed a lot. <laughs> but the fact is, is that, you know, as you think about all the ways that, and, and my son who graduated from Pepperdine Law School about five years ago, he's working in-house at a, at, a, at a corporation. Mm -hmm. And he got assigned to be the person who handles a uh, some governmental agency. You know, didn't want insisted on a recall. They produced some product that was, had put the public at danger. And and his negotiations of you know, okay, what do we have to do to satisfy the regulator here? Um, and 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 then he has to go back to the client, you know, the company, and say, okay, they want you to do such and such. Well, that's ridiculous. And and here he is negotiating and mediating between, you know, uh, so, so all the things that lawyers do, you know, I have not seen a statistic, but I would guess that, you know, at most, I'd say a third of people who graduate from law school, you know, find themselves representing a plaintiff against a defendant as compared to some bureaucratic role. Um, and, and the idea of Batna and what have you, uh, there is, we, we haven't framed it up that way yet. So your whole re-engineering of legal education to kind of say, you know, how good are you? And I know one of the things that, that you've talked about is just kind of appreciating the client's big picture um, and their goals and their needs and, and how do I help them accomplish that? Um, uh, do, do you have a reaction about, 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 uh, about thinking about this outside of the litigation environment? Sure. Um, well, uh, I think this three-part structure and working with clients is something that can be applied in transactional settings and administrative settings. Obviously it needs to be adapted. It can be, uh, done in criminal law settings. Um, uh, I have a blog post uh, called Tyra uh, talking about transactional interest and risk assessment, thinking about how one would adapt um, the same basic three-part structure, anticipating what the, in, in the context of a transaction, what the net profit would be uh, of various alternatives and thinking about the various contingencies uh, that might affect the profits. And then thinking about the costs, the tangible costs of negotiating and consummating a deal, which would be analogous to the litigation costs. And then thinking about the various intangible consequences, often benefits, but sometimes costs of engaging in a transaction with a particular partner or um, an, another, uh, you know, or, or, and of course in the transactional context, there may be multiple potential partners. Um, someone asked me about criminal law, and I'm planning to write a blog post about criminal Lyra. Um, I've done some interviews with criminal lawyers, and, and so what happens there is you have prosecutors and defense counsel, and they're anticipating what the likely outcome would be in court, what the, uh, if they went to trial, what a typical plea bargain would be, and then they make some, um, you know, arguments about that, and then thinking about the costs, which um, 
aren't necessarily in terms of dollars, but there are a variety of other costs for, for, for the prosecutors and defendants. And one could apply this in lots of different contexts. So that three-part structure makes sense as well as thinking about working with clients. Um, so, you know, we just happen to be focusing on litigation, which is a major activity that many lawyers do, but it can, this, this way of thinking can be applied in lots of contexts. Um, John, let's take a step back for a second. We got, we got Russell from UCLA. We have Hawaii represented here. We have Pepperdine. We have Missouri. We have, we have the programs that have a substantial, if not a lot, substantial support from their deans, from the presidents of the universities. Uh, and, and we are blessed at Pepperdine, of course, to have the, the terrific support we have. What about the programs that are struggling to introduce negotiation, mediation, even as a curriculum in their law school? How do you convince their deans? What do you tell them? Is your, uh, when they say, these are soft skills, what we need is get better in, in, in contracts and torts and constitutional law. Uh, do you have a letter, do you have, a, you have something, <laughs> two page uh, 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 message that you will send to them? And uh, could you brief that for us? <laughs> Well, I'm not sure that they would um, find something from me particularly persuasive. Um, they might find this report that I mentioned earlier from the um, IAALS uh, more persuasive about what practicing lawyers need. Um, one of the challenges is that there are so, I mean, legal education is, there, there are so many barriers to change um, in legal education in terms of um, bar passage rates, U.S. news, um, <laughs> the, the, the tenure system, um, the, 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 the textbook industry um, in terms of the courses. I mean, changing it is just really, really very, very hard. Um, and I guess one of the things that I have thought is that is to encourage more incorporation of these things in a range of other courses. And I mean, obviously it's important to have uh, specific standalone courses in the various ADR fields. And from my perspective, having done the work that I've done, I'm particularly interested in negotiation because this is what most lawyers do, mediation and arbitration and a variety of other things occur to some extent, but negotiation I think is, is much more common and particularly throughout a case, not just the resolution of the, the end of the case. So it's important to have those courses. Um, I think there are lots of reasons, and I've alluded to some, but there are lots more why it's going to be hard to develop these more of these programs. And to some extent, I think some of them are going to shrink. So to the extent that we're going to continue and perpetuate our ideas, um, I think the good news and the bad news is that it's going to have to be through some of the more traditional courses and working with some of our colleagues to, uh, to do that. And, and again, I mean, uh, my perspective is that that's what University of Missouri Columbia, you know, that's what you guys at the very beginning of your center wanted to say, how do we help integrate these skills into the first year curriculum? And you know, I remember a couple of publications, you guys had simulations for torts and for contracts and, and to kind of make it accessible for the doctrinal professors to, uh, to work some things in. Uh, we did. And in fact, actually that went down in a, a ball of smoke <laughs> um, because, uh, um, it, it was a, a great idea. It, my, a lot of you probably know or know of Len Riskin, who um, unfortunately no longer is at Missouri, um, just a dear friend um, and a great guy. And he was hired in 1984 to help develop that structure. And at the time, of course, we had Hewlett and we got a lot of money from Hewlett. And so there was, uh, they, they incorporated this into all the first year courses. They had, you know, little bits of money for faculty developed simulations. It was a hard thing to perpetuate because, you know, faculty would turn over and the ones who initially developed it, you know, moved on to a variety of other things. The faculty who continued teaching it um, weren't, um, as committed to it, this required a lot of coordination. I mean, it's not easy. Um, 
imp uh, to, to do. And eventually what we did was we um, stopped doing this pervasive method of integrating it into all the first year courses. And starting in 2005, I think, 2004, we have a standalone lawyering course, which I taught uh, actually from the very beginning until I retired in 2015. <laughs> Um, and so it's a three credit course that's taught in the first year, um, basically lawyer client relations, um, interviewing, counseling, negotiation, mediation, a little bit of arbitration. Um, so that's, I mean, it's in some ways it's a cautionary tale about the difficulty of incorporating it into the rest of the curriculum. And it's an ongoing process because there's this constant turnover of faculty. So um, it, it's not easy. Yeah, John, I've, I've been with Lynn many times, and, uh, and just so you know, I, I appreciate your transparency because I, I thought you guys had it all figured out and that you were hitting home runs every time. And to find out that, uh, that, that you guys have uh, some of the same challenges the rest of us have, I tell you, you've made me feel better about myself already. <laughs> well, then I guess this conversation is worth it right then and there. I mean, your self-esteem is something that is very important to me, and I'm glad that we've been able to boost that a little bit. But I mean, it's a challenge. Um, I, I've talked with folks um, in, you know, in other programs, you know, that have, you know, a lot of resources devoted to ADR, and it's not easy for lots of reasons. Um, yeah. and part of it, in some ways, is a mindset. I think one of the things, and, and some of you may be able to talk about is about how, um, uh, you know, it, working with colleagues and, and changing in some ways the, the culture of practice, of culture of teaching. Um, and some of you, of course, one of the things is, you know, I've been gabbing a lot. Um, we may be wanting to engage other people to uh, throw in their two cents, although, you know, I'm a retired law professor, so I could talk forever, but um, so. I I would love to hear from our colleagues in this room. We have a few minutes left and I wanna see if anybody has any comments, any questions, any thoughts you would like to share. I'll quickly share that Hamlin, which is now Michelle Hamlin, our great friends there, Jim Corbin, Kitty and others. Um, they have, Shannon Press, they have used innovative terminology to try to impress one else to come to mediation negotiation. I remember them using problem solving lawyering and the problem solving atmosphere, business lawyering and negotiation skills. And I, I also know they, they, they have a, a one lecture given to every 1L class on introduction to dispute resolution, which I think is a fascinating idea to plant that seed in young minds when they come to the first 1L. Uh, anybody in this room would like to sh ask a question, have a- Or make a comment, you know. A challenge John on anything he said, you know. Wait a second. Let's not go crazy. He can stand and do do, do his photography thing, which we <laughs> you got to do that for us. <laughs> I have a question. Sure. You know, I wrote one in here about which which paper article book was the most satisfying to write and why. But one of my questions I have, because I, I see on your blog post, sometimes you'll write about, you know, uniform language. I can't remember the term you use and some other things. You're such a gentle, understated scholar but i wonder if you have any pet peeves i just want well, to hear a john landy pet peeve <laughs> in the dispute that. resolution world or with law professors or something like that you're go well, you're retired now you can tell us i'm so curious yeah, right uh, i don't have to worry about getting tenure um <laughs> so um I, I i'm it's it's interesting that you describe me as being understated i sort of feel like uh, my you know, posts, you know, have all this uh, rage coming out, um, but I guess I've sublimated it uh, sufficiently. The, the, the clear language one is one that has driven me crazy. And I would love, and, and this may be the group to do it, that this should not be so damn hard. Um, why the <laughs> hell, and you know, forgive me for cursing, but why the hell do we have this crazy language where we use lots of different terms for these models that are make you know th that are ambiguous, that are confusing. We don't even damn understand them ourselves, let alone trying to foist them on these poor, unsuspecting students. Not to mention the parties. Um, so it could be so much better. I mean, we could have. I mean, Pepperdine. This would be a great project, seriously, for you all to convene a group to. Um, develop to, to look at the language and come up with some 
um, some suggestions for um, you know, clear, plain language that, that everyone could understand instead of these you know, models. I mean, why we're still using facilitative and evaluative um, mediation that just, it refers to so many different things and people, I mean, assessing the strengths and weaknesses is one thing, pressing people to settle, making proposals. These are all very different things that people have different feelings about and why we still keep on using facilitative and evaluative. Souk Simran, of course, when Souk was my student, we call them Souk now, we call them Souk Simran. This is your chance, man. Um, organize this effort. You can convene a bunch of people to study this, do some focus groups. It, it need not be so long. So, and Stephanie, I'm sure, would be happy to help because she's got a lot of free time, I know. And um, just because yeah, yeah, John, a, a baby, that's, that's, you know, a lot of people have babies. That, you know, <laughs> I love get over it. it. That, that would be, you know, you wanted to ask about my pet peeves and what my... And, my and we're going to recruit you, John, to to help us with the planning committee as you, you're going to chair the planning. Have you know that? So no, I'm not going to chair, but I'll be happy to help us. You know, one one thing on a serious note, John, that, that is troubling uh, to get really serious for a second is where is our field failing? I love that you brought up, we're still stuck on facilitative, evaluative, and we're not looking into... Why has interest-based bargaining not worked? Why are people still doing distributed bargaining in DC and our politics? Our nation is divided. We are all in a difficult, I'm, I'm assuming we're not happy right now. We're not delighted waking up in the morning. Wow, DC is functioning so well. So where is our field lacking and what can we do differently to produce better leaders? I mean, these are some questions that are clearly troubling me the most. So I absolutely agree with you is we have a lot more to do. We have to be creative and smart on this. Yeah, that's a really big one um, in terms of solving the problem in Washington and our politics. And um, I've written a number of things about reconciliation. Um, I would love to see some truth and reconciliation efforts done um, and, you know, respecting and listening carefully to the wide range of people, the people who really are the strong believers in Trump and the people who really um, have strong feelings against them. I think, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, a lot of people feel upset and angry and disrespected and not heard. And if there would be a way that everybody, I mean, certainly, you know, thinking about my background in politics and philosophy, I'm concerned about people who historically have been, um, underrepresented and, and treated badly and discriminated against and, and the subject of prejudice in our society. And I think that we as a society need to um, make some um, recompense. We need to deal with that. We need to come to terms with our histori historic injustices to a wide range of people. At the same time, we also need to appreciate that there are a lot of people who have not been victims in those same ways, who have felt vulnerable and stressed. And um, so, for example, one one example are you know the the relations between police and um, minority communities. Um, I certainly feel very sympathetic to the minority communities. I also feel sympathetic to a lot of police officers. We have just a ton of handguns and, and guns out there. And uh, uh, this doesn't justify or excuse a lot of the abusive behavior by police, but I, I just imagine that they're going through a very difficult time as well. And so having some way to acknowledge and understand the different perspectives, um, I would hope would help. Now, I'm not holding my breath that that's gonna happen soon, I mean, it's interesting that um, President-elect Biden has talked a lot about this. Um, it doesn't seem as if the Republicans are interested at the moment, whether they would be open to it going forward once he is inaugurated. Um, I'm not holding my breath, but something like that I, would be what I would hope um, would happen. I mean, I suppose, well, might I just stop there? Oh, absolutely. 
and giving people more cross-cultural understanding and knowing how to empathize, how to understand, how to ask right questions. Absolutely. Um, I don't want to take it away. Peter, your, your, your turn. Go ahead. You know, um, uh, we, we have the benefit here of uh, UC Irvine uh, just launching you know, a new law school, what was it, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 years ago. Uh, but uh, for those of us in Southern California, we know that part of what they did is they put the flag in the ground saying, we are going to be a school that's committed to externships and to clinical education and to experiential learning. Uh, again, still in the traditional realm, I believe. I don't believe that they have a, uh, I, I know Carrie Menominco uh, teaches there. So, so, but the fact is, is that, uh, but, but there, there's, a, there's a program that says if you want to have practical experience as part of your, your legal education, you know, we want to be your law school and a very highly respected law school with highly respected scholars. And, uh, and you know, John, for you to challenge all of us to kind of say, you know, uh, would a law school um, uh, be well respected if it, if it says we will be the, the you know, the school that says that uh, the, 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 the that thinking in the ways that you're challenging us to think and to train lawyers in the way that you're challenging us to train them. That uh, so. So, do you think that the uh, the other uh, the other legal educators would respect a school that took as strong of a stand for for an ADR curriculum as compared to a clinical uh, experiential uh, curriculum like uh, UC Irvine did? Probably not. Um, and actually, from my perspective, if I had a choice, I'd probably go for the clinical. Um, the curriculum because I mean, part of it is that the law students need to have this real client experience and certainly uh, there are schools that have clinics including yours uh, mediation clinics um, but as we were talking about before having experience with the court system and litigation is really really important uh, this you know study that I referred to before was talking about the importance of clinical education I mean and I guess this isn't new and original to me, but um, there's been a whole clinical law movement. And, um, you know, if I were king of the legal education world, I would, uh, well, one, I would um, make sure that everybody had a chance to, not only a chance, but a requirement to do uh, clinical education. I mean, think about, you know, med school, you know, you have students that have to go through uh, an internship and a residency before you know, you let them loose on people unsupervised. Uh, we should have something like that. Um, there are countries like Canada where basically before you can get licensed, you have to spend a year doing what they call articling where you have a, essentially an internship. So again, if I, if, if, I, if I had my druthers and I'd like to know what a druther is, but if I had my druthers, <laughs> then um, I would, um, do away with the bar exam. I would say to get licensed, you'd have to graduate from law school and then spend a year with uh, an internship like this. And I'd require clinical education. Unfortunately, you know, clinical education doesn't get them a lot more. I mean, it isn't that respected, um, you know, that uh, any more than ADR or not much more than ADR. Um, you know, if I, you know, you may have seen my blog post about negotiation school. And if I could, I would make it so that, you know, that the people who teach clinical and externship courses in legal writing, they would get paid the most <laughs> and they would have the highest status and they would get tenure. And that the people who teach con law would be on year to year contracts and they would, um, you know, they would, you know, maybe get a chance to vote in faculty meetings in a couple of, you know, very enlightened law schools. Um, but unfortunately, we have things upside down. It's just bizarre to me that legal writing instructors have the lowest status and the lowest pay and the hardest jobs. And they get, you know, the, the Rodney Dangerfields of, of legal education. They just don't get no respect. And, and clinical legal education is in some ways much like that. Um, and ADR is in that same category. I, I, John Landy has started his talk just now. Now he's, this is the beginning. <laughs> this is, this is the beginning. John, well, we, we're about, about coming to an end, but, but on the formal conversation, I have one question and then we can have an informal conversation with some of our adjuncts who want to stay and talk to you for half an hour. If you, thanks for giving us your time. And that is with, with coronavirus and this pandemic for the last many months, things have changed. So I have a dual two-step question. One is how has it changed negotiation, if you may, or the other one is 
do you have trust? And we have our answer because we've been doing things online, but do you have faith that we could, we are able to teach these skills remotely in a remote setting as effectively as we could on the ground? Um, well, I'm in terms of the second question, uh, I'm probably not the right guy to ask because I'm retired from teaching. So you all have been <laughs> doing this stuff and uh, you know, you have the experience. Now I've been, um, one of the things I've loved is that Stephanie has organized these uh, calls every other week. And so um, I've been able to eavesdrop and uh, you know, hear what people are actually doing. Um, and you know, it, in some ways it's better, in some ways it's worse. It's obviously a challenge. Uh, I've talked with some folks who have described that they've, they, they really see some benefits. I think over time, as people get experience with it, um, you will learn how to do it um, better and better and will see some advantages. Um, obviously there are, you know, missing the in-person interaction is a, a real loss. Um, but I mean, unfortunately, looking at the trend of the infections, this is not going away anytime soon. And so I think for the rest of this year and maybe even next year, this is what's going to be happening. Uh, so uh, you're going to have to, you know, both in terms of education as well as practice, um, I have pushed another one of my brilliant ideas that doesn't go very far, uh, which is the idea of these multi-session mediations, which I think having uh, the, using the, you know, Zoom and, and video really uh, could make a lot better uh, than these marathon mediations, which thank goodness I don't do and haven't survived, but they just sound ghastly uh, for everyone in some ways, particularly the mediators who are just on duty for 12 hours straight, um, not to mention the parties who are stressed. So a long way of saying, you know, you don't, you're not going to have a choice. This is the life we're going to be living for at least six to 12 months. And then, you know, even after we go back to whatever is normal, um, people are going to see that there are a lot of advantages. So it's going to be really interesting to see what life is going to be like after the infection rate goes down and after people have had vaccines and, and the, this fear of, of interacting in person isn't as great. Can we join um, in thanking Professor John Landy for his, for his time with us? This is well, thank you all for coming. And uh, um, Aparna, back to you. I'm going to turn my light on over here so I'm not in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thanks so much, John and Peter and, and Tuximran for this excellent conversation. Um, I think that we had talked with our adjuncts um, about um, a, just an informal roundtable if any of them had questions for John about teaching techniques and strategies. Um, and so this, this discussion that we had uh, in the last hour just leads us into, into that uh, workshop. Um, so if I know if there's several adjuncts, you can, you're welcome to stay if you'd like. Um, we have some students on the call, a couple that I see. Uh, students are welcome to go on to the next class um, so that they can, um, we can, we can really just open this, this floor up for um, the educators in the room. And everybody, whatever, educators, practitioners, students, clowns, whatever. <laughs> well, I hey, John, John I, I, wait, I have a question, John. <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off a partner, please. You can, you can, I'll, I'll stand down, go ahead. Well, I, I just, I don't teach, but I had a quick question based on our discussion um, about, you know, when we're talking about, um, you know, the role of ADR programs within legal curricula, um, you know, it can, it seems to me that having non-JD programs at virtually all law schools opens a possibility for coursework to shift um, and opens a possibility of law students to mingle with LLM and master's students. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could comment a little bit about uh, if there's an opportunity for dispute resolution faculty to really push for those programs gently within uh, within their administrations and, and the role that adjuncts can also play play in that push. 
Uh, great question. I'm thrilled about it. Um, fortunately, <laughs> don't tell anyone um, that I'm about to say what I'm about to say, and just because I know that this is being recorded, but just pretend that it isn't. Um, <laughs> when I was directing our LLM program, um, I pushed hard to accept some people into our LLM program who didn't have a law degree. And, um, uh, and uh, it was hard and it got pushed back. And then after, uh, I mean, a lot of pushback. And this was people who, you know, these were people who had, you know, a lot of life experience and, um, and they really added a lot to our program. And we were able to do it for a couple of years. And then I was no longer the direct of the LM program and it, it didn't happen. The other thing that uh, is going on now at my law school is we are undergoing a lot of budget pressure. And so we are now uh, teaching all these courses, you know, we're trying to teach as many non-JD students as we can because we need the money. Um, and so this is not your idealistic, oh, let's teach the world. Um, it's we need the money. And, um, <laughs> and I think, you know, it's too bad because I, I mean, it's good because I think that it's useful to have these interactions. It's unfortunate this is the the motivation for doing it. Um, I think there's a lot of potential for for good interaction between students, law students, and for example, students who, who are in other uh, professional programs such as business or um, counseling. Um, I did a, um, a, a simulation with someone in um, counseling psychology. I was teaching a family law dispute resolution course and that was just phenomenal to have, you know, some of their students and some of my students um, do a simulation together. Um, it takes more effort and planning, but I think there's a lot of potential. So, awesome. Stefan, go ahead. You're yeah, ready. yeah, no, I just wanted to, because um, <clears throat> we're talking about kind of introducing or kind of looking at the culture of law school and kind of kind of bringing this thing, uh, bringing this. Um, the skill set of negotiation, mediation, et cetera, into the more into the center. My question is, like, how many? What's the what's the percentage of cases that actually end up being litigated versus? You know, I mean, so like, I wonder, is like, how can? Because I mean, this is what lawyers do. They make a case to like persuade people. <laughs> so I'm wondering, like, how can we make a case to say that this is actually most of your time is do, like the percentage of your time is, is spent mostly doing this versus doing that? Like, would that be something that could maybe help shift? The, the, the conversation. And I know that there's been tons of, and, and the, the, other, the other part of that question is, because I feel like it's almost obvious that that's obviously making the most sense, but I think there's other interests like, you know, financial, like status, like these other things that I think are at play. And maybe you could speak to that for me. Cause I'm just like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not an attorney. I, I work with a lot of lawyers, uh, but, but I'm just like, this is interesting to me. This kind of you know, I, I wish we could flatten the field out a little bit, but it, I think it's not in everyone's interest to do that. Yeah, well, I think you're right in terms of uh, people's interests. Um, what you're describing, it would be very reasonable, um, but then you're talking about law school. So one shouldn't necessarily assume that that would be the, the basis for making decisions. Um, I'm being semi-facetious. Um, part of it is that they're just all these structures, and I alluded to them before, that just make it really, really, really hard to change. Um, and um, so I guess in some ways, part of it, it, it yeah, I mean, I think that the integration of, of these concepts into, into teaching would be wonderful. I just wrote a blog post about someone who I'd never heard about before. Some of you may have seen this blog post about, um, Chris Franklin at New York Law School, and she teaches a family law course, and this is, you know, intended to teach family law doctrine, and it's exclusively through the use of simulation. So it's not just, you know, like what we did here at, at Missouri, where we'd have one class that would be a simulation in a tort class for a year long. No, the entire class is taught through simulations. And, um, and she says that, you know, she has structured it and obviously it took a lot of effort and time, I'm sure, to get to the point where she could teach it this way, but that in the course, you know, through this course, 
she, her students learned all of the doctrine that students were learned in the traditional family law courses. So in, to me, that would be a, a wonderful way of doing it. And so, I mean, and, and I, as I understand it, you know, they go through a whole range of procedures, including negotiation and discovery and, you know, argument in court. Um, and so to me, that would be the ideal. Um, it just would require a huge shift in mindset and, and effort to do. And I'm not sure that, I mean, the problem is that, that there's just a tremendous amount. I mean, some of you are, are experienced law faculty here um, can talk about this, maybe John Barkey could, about how hard it is to change the, the structure of law school. I mean, people, faculty have the courses that they're used to teaching. Um, you have tenure, you have scholarship requirements. Um, you, it's it just really, really, and, and you have everybody fitting together like this jigsaw puzzle. So it's, you know, changing one piece of the jigsaw puzzle is hard if you're not gonna change the whole jigsaw puzzle. John, do, what, what would you say about this? I don't think things are gonna change. Um, I've been going back and forth between this meeting and one where my wife, who's a bar examiner, is having a meeting with some of the uh, people from our law school about the bar exam. I mean, and the number one issue besides funding these days is passing the bar exam um, and changing the curriculum to take less law out of it, I think is totally impossible. I mean, the statistics from the National Bar Examiner, whatever the organization is, but the Bar Examiner magazine says 25% of all first time test takers don't pass the bar, they fail it. Um, so in the top 20 law schools, 95 to 98% uh, pass. So those are different programs, but even for the programs here, and I saw Russell here before when UCLA might make it in there and might not, I don't think you're gonna expand it. And, and what you're saying too, John, I think our students are um, not getting a broad enough legal education. I don't wanna expand any ADR courses at my school. Although when I leave, there's probably not gonna be many more there. But um, law school has changed since many of us on this call have gone to law school. I mean, um, there was no intellectual property. There was no a whole variety of things. I mean, students are graduating. The vast majority of students don't take tax anymore. And if you're negotiating settlements, there's tax implications and stuff. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult. And the structure, my last comment, the structure, we the faculty members have gotten hold of the structure. The idea of faculty governance, I think, is not so good sometimes. But um, the, the class offerings are based on, at least at our school, each instructor teaching six credits a semester. Um, and that's going to be either two, three credits, two, three credit courses, or a two and a four. I think students need even if they don't want to specialize, they need a credit of labor law. They need a credit of wills and trusts. They need at least a credit of uh, intellectual property. Hopefully they're going to be, an, there'll be an employee or they will have employees. They'll have enough money that they can have a trust. Pass things. People need to general, more generalization. And I think with certificates, we're seeing a lot of specialization. And our students are graduating, I think, without a broad overview of the practice of law. And I think most people in their 20s do not know what kind of law they're going to practice for the next 50 years. Um, yeah, and, and let me respond to that, John. I, I guess one of the things that, I mean, and, and this in some ways, um, Stefan, goes to your question in terms of why there aren't changes. And one of them is the bar exam. And another one is US News. Um, and you put those two together and it's just really, really hard to change the structure. This um, IELTS report um, talks about the, they're very critical of exams and particularly exams that require memorization of a lot of detailed rules. So John, I would agree with you that it would be good for students to have a broader knowledge of things, what this IELTS report talks about is understanding general concepts and not necessarily this, you know, Byzantine collection of rules that we make students memorize that they, you know, forget immediately and that in practice, 
they, they would, it would be malpractice if they relied on their memory of these rules from law school. So they need to understand basic concepts and it'd be good to understand a, a wide variety of them. Part of what this report is also talking about is being able to put together the rules into the big picture. And part of the problem with legal education is we teach lots of different pieces and we assume that the students are gonna be able to integrate it all. And this process of integrating is actually a very challenging one, thinking strategically. And we just don't teach that as far as I can see. And to me, this kind of goes back to a question that Tuk Simran was asking about what thinking like a lawyer is about. In my view, it's really putting the pieces together. And, and part of what this Isles report also talks about is that in practice, you know, you, you're right, John, that they don't know what they're going to do when they graduate, but they're gonna learn on the job. Um, and part of it is they're gonna to need to get counseling from other lawyers, um, some advice as to what law is relevant. Um, so um, anyway, what else? So I, I just wanna mention that um, Easy for me, teaching in the, um, uh, in the online program, one of the joys of that has been the diversity of backgrounds. Um, of people and not just having law students. Um, I would love to have more because I teach family mediation. I would love to have more from the mental health professions as well. I don't know how to get them in, but it's just been wonderful having all those different approaches and thoughts. And uh, the LLM students um, have added a lot, uh, particularly in intimidating the other students. But well, that's uh, a benefit. <laughs> And, and there, there needs to be a way to sort of tamp them down because they sort of feel like they own the field. But, but it really has made a difference to me to be able to teach a broad um, uh, diversity of, of backgrounds. It's been great. I definitely think that, I mean, again, I, I'm not doing this myself, but I, I can see the potential for lots of benefits from this online teaching. Um, so I, and I, it's, it's interesting to hear you describe your experience, Ina. What else? Don't be shy. Be shy. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll make a couple comments here. Great. So I, I kind of want to add to what Zena said. I think that there's so much of a need for understanding the psychology and mental health issues today. We've got adolescents, 25% of them would meet the diagnosis of a mental disorder for the first time that I've ever known. And I study personality disorders, which the manual says is 15% of US adults, which may be more than those with a, an alcohol or drug addiction. And I think that there's these two different fields, psychology and law, really are being forced into marriage because we're really so, we're seeing the high conflict behavior of people with personality disorders and other mental health problems. And I, I just really think that needs to get taught. And um, I'm proud to be part of Pepperdine, which is teaching this. Uh, through me and Stephanie and just the idea of psychology of conflict and communication skills. So I didn't know if you wanted to comment on that aspect of legal education, but I think that is, is just around the bend and needs to get addressed. Sure. Well, would you also add to that the issue of, of trauma-informed um, teaching and responsiveness? Or maybe you'd like to talk about that, Zena. No, I was I actually like somebody who knows more about it because to <laughs> me, that's one of the things that's happening as I'm teaching is there's so much trauma and the reactions of the students um, is just heightened because I mean, because of everything that's going on anyway. But um, as I teach family stuff, what comes out is early trauma and then recent trauma and then <laughs> ongoing trauma. Well, let me just add something here with that, because trauma is definitely part of a lot of adult mental health issues and unresolved trauma, untreated trauma. But I think adding a little piece here, litigation is itself traumatic for people who have a trauma, a trauma history. 
And I know from practicing family law in court for 15 years and mediation for close to 40 years, that a lot of what, what happens is people are playing out or replaying their trauma in a legal setting. And it's not legal issues, it's psychological issues masquerading as legal issues. And the public is paying for the litigation system, which doesn't, can't fix these problems. So it's a, it's a dilemma that needs to get addressed. Yeah, let me comment two things. One is, as I mentioned earlier, for me, one of the great benefits of our book is this focus on these intangible costs. And so we have a chapter that is dealing with intangible costs of individuals and another one of intangible costs for organizations. The one dealing with intangible costs for individuals gets into a lot of the, the traumatic things that, that are aggravated by litigation that I think you're alluding to. And part of what we want to do is sensitize people. I mean, even if you had people who are at a baseline of normal, whatever that is, you know, this aggravates it. And then of course you have people who, you know, who's normal um, is, you know, everybody has stuff that they wait, that they bring into it. So being sensitive to how litigation can just make things worse and really the trauma that you're referring to is really important. The other thing is that um, there's a book that is coming out um, or that, that is in the process of being written. I'm still on the publication part of the section of dispute resolution, um, talking about dealing with, we've been talking about how to frame it, but basically mental health issues and dealing with them or, and we've been trying to think about whether we define it as mental health issues or, I mean, cause everybody has stuff um, and particularly dealing with clients who have stuff um, and um, I'm very excited about it and I can't tell you exactly what the guy's authors, I don't know if you know Dan Bernstein in New York, some of you may know him um, and he's writing it and I'm very impressed with the proposal. So presumably in this next year, there will be a book coming out that may address the sorts of things that you're talking about, Bill and Zena. What else? I just want to repeat what, how beautifully Bill said that, that we can't fix legal issues, which are actually psychological issues. It's just very powerful. We need to think about that. I'd like to just come in from, I'm in the UK. Um, Hello. Hi. And uh, I'm a family mediator and we've recently had a judgment uh, where the judge refused to make an order. He declined to make an order, not because he couldn't, but because he wouldn't, where the parents were arguing over which motorway junction the child should be ex handed over at. And this has got, it's a whole, uh, whole long, long, long saga. And this is not the first time this has happened. And he basically saying, you have to sort things out. You cannot bring these things to court because for a start, if you think about it, who's gonna supervise this? And what happens if, if, if it's a breach? And the handover's on a weekend, or, you know. And so it's very interesting because that's been reacted to in two ways about, you know, obviously uh, from a legal perspective, wanting to um, make sure that you advise your clients, you've got to have really watertight uh, advice to the clients about this. And then also people saying, well, no, that's right. We shouldn't have that at public expense because the judges are funded from our taxes. So, it's an example and I, the only thing I would caution and I, I do have a mental health background, um, I would caution about rushing to judgment about what's wrong with people. I mean, if you read DSM-5, you will have everything in there. I can guarantee you will have every syndrome, every everything. And I think it's very easy to label. And there's been, you know, the whole thing about parental alienation is accepted, but I think it's very easy to rush to judgment and, and label it that when there may be something, a really genuine thing that isn't parental alienation, for example, in the field of family work. But it is interesting that, that this now is, it's got a bit out of hand and uh, we've got huge increase in people going to litigation and the courts are saying, look, you know, enough is enough. Yeah, let me just say, Barbara, that 
um, this book that I mentioned, um, I think well, is, is very consistent with what you're talking about in terms of not labeling um, and, and the problems that, the, the, that are caused by labeling and how to manage that. And, and this is an area that is not something I've worked in a lot. So my language isn't the best about it, but I know that the, the author himself is very clear that he himself has some mental health issues um, and how to deal with that. And the fact that, we, again, whether you have a DSM diagnosis or not, people you know, have challenges. We have challenges dealing with each other. And it's really, as I understand what he's talking about is how you handle those challenges rather than labeling them and diagnosing and treating them as such. Um, and I think that that's what he plans to write about in this book. Thank you. Go ahead, Andre. Uh, yes, um, I, I do have one question that is quite intriguing me for the past few years. Uh, the U.S. has been discussing the causes of popular dissatisfaction with the administration of justice since the beginning of last century. I'm, I'm Brazilian, by the way. Um, we have been discussing this for much less time in Brazil, but um, to one extent, um, mediation has presented itself as a promise to address this popular dissatisfaction with the administration of justice, but I don't feel it has fulfilled this promise so far. And the feeling I have is that we don't have a process market fit. Uh, pro probably we have this segment of uh, the U.S. dispute resolution market that is very open to uh, facilitative approaches and mediation. Wonderful. A, a larger segment open to evaluative mediation because basically they want to get over with it and they don't, they don't want to go to court. But uh, there's more to be addressed and uh, understood on dispute resolution practices that I feel that we have been able to put our hands on. And uh, probably this would be uh, finding a way to um, discover what is that the users want from our um, dispute resolution system, presenting it in a more uh, wide way, basically, not only our courts in adjudicative processes, but also uh, mediative uh, processes uh, in a broad range. Uh, where should we go from here? That's the question. Mm. On, on finding process, pr process market fit, yes. Yeah, well, it's a great question. And um, I guess I'm an expert, so I should know the answer. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think about you know, particularly in terms of mediation, uh, you know, I, I think there's a real difference in the family context and the non-family civil context. Um, in the non-family civil context, which I will just simply call civil, even though family is civil um, or civil law, anyway, um, is that um, I think it's just so dominated by lawyers that, um, and, you know, there's a lot written about how clients are very frustrated with lawyers and lawyers are very frustrated with clients. Um, and so part of the problem is that that is a cause of a lot of poor fit is that the lawyers are thinking very much about the, the law and the clients are thinking about that along with all sorts of other things, these intangible elements. In the family context, I think that um, it's I suspect that there's a lot more orientation to um, what the clients are looking for, in part because there are so many issues that aren't monetary and, um, and that there's more of a recognition that lawyers aren't necessarily the, the ones who should be the ones to decide and to manage the process as much. Um, again, I think there's probably a lot of variation here. My guess is that, that there's probably be a better fit in, in the family context for those reasons. Uh, some of you, Zena and Barbara and maybe others, 
um, could comment whether this is consistent or different or Bill, um, from your perspective or not. Um, I guess in some ways, part of it just goes back at, you know, this thing I've been reading, this IELTS report, which I've been reading a lot and writing about recently is just focusing on clients and, and listening to them and hearing what their concerns are, which are complex and often, you know, they want to win, they want good results, or a lot of times they don't want to get to lose. They want to be treated with respect. I mean, they just have a whole laundry list of these intangible uh, concerns. And unfortunately, lawyers, we just don't train lawyers very well in the United States to listen and pay attention and deal with those very well. Um, and I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Actually, we've got some experts here. So Bill, Zena, Barbara, any, what, what would you say? How would you answer Andre's question? Have to unmute. There you go, Bill. I, I wasn't clear what the question was out of that. <laughs> well, I heard it is how did the, there's a poor, well, maybe you want to just re summarize it, Andre. It, it feels that we're not reaching our public. Um, and, and the question is are we not reaching our public because we don't, um, we haven't designed a process that fits the public? the way the public wants to uh, have uh, their dispute solved? Well, I'll, my comments have a lot to do with the media. The public really likes the, um, the Coliseum effect of, <laughs> of family law, of politics, of workplace conflicts. And my feeling is people just know that if you're getting divorced, you look for a lawyer and who's a good lawyer, and that the lawyer should take your case to court. You have a 14 day trial and the judge realizes that you're wonderful and the other person is, you know, the scum of the earth. And um, that's not at all what happens. But I think, I think we do have a responsibility really as, as family lawyers at least to really educate them about negotiation and mediation. And there's pressure coming and state laws coming that say you have to inform your clients of these alternatives. So I think, I think you're right, Andre, that it's partly the profession needs to, needs to emphasize that. But I, I really think the bigger problem is the media image. And really since, I don't remember, maybe 1990s with court TV, Judge Judy and all that, I think we've really harmed people's impression of what the law is and how it can help rather than decide winners and losers. Oh, it goes back, you know, I think about Perry Mason. I think that that actually may have been even worse. I think there's this image that you're going to have this wonderful, great lawyer, this fatherly uncle kind of guy, and he's going to rescue you at the end. And there's going to be this wonderful courtroom and they're going to be all excited and and, you know, it, it's going to be wonderful at the end. I think that there's this kind of drama. I mean, and you can, I mean, you can look at back in American television anyway, and there's just a whole line of these TV shows that make lawyers into the heroes. And just like in law school, the clients are, you know, there are these cut out, these, these um, bit players who just sort of happen to be there who, you know, provide you know, grist for the mill for the lawyers to do their heroic stuff. But we've been doing this a long time, even before court TV. I mean, this is just, it's, it's in our, our, our entertainment, it's in our news. You know, you see the lawyers as the heroes in the, the court cases. Occasionally you'll have the parties who will say a few things in front of the mic, but it's the lawyers. Um, so I, I think you're onto something. Unfortunately, it, it goes back longer and deeper than what you're mentioning. I would let me quickly add something, and that is Canada recently changed their divorce act for the country, requiring people to work on a parenting plan and mediate their issues before they can go to court. The U.S. isn't there yet, except for parenting issues, but for all their issues. So I think law schools in Canada are going to have to change, like you're talking about, John. Uh, maybe it's on its way here. 
Uh, I mean, I won't go into it all because it would just take far too much time, but if you want legal aid, which we still have for um, uh, certain family work, the government has made it that some mediation, certainly a first session is um, funded by the state if one person is eligible. And before that, we have what we call a mediation information assessment meeting, which is basically an intake meeting that is, uh, can be funded. I, again, it's too complicated to discuss. But what you find is that people do their best to use that. They use it as actually an obstacle to get over. <laughs> because the other side of this is this justice and fairness and the truth will be out. There will be a modern day morality play where, the, where everything will be played out and evil will be exposed and they will come out of it on the right side. And this is the narrative. This yeah. is the narrative and it's endorsed by the media. It's endorsed in um, the, the sort of, you know, Jerry Springer, all that stuff that's embedded now in our thoughts. And I recently had a very interesting discussion with um, a very old friend who got back in touch with me because she's now going through a divorce. And it was really interesting to talk with her in a way that I can't do with clients about her expectations. And she had no sense at all of really what was gonna, was gonna happen. She had a good lawyer, she's a very intelligent person, but she had this same morality play going on. And I, I kind of disabused her of it by the end of the conversation. She hasn't been in touch with me since. <laughs> <laughs> Don't expect a Christmas card. Yeah, but I actually did say to her, she was being made a good offer. And now I never give advice, but I just said to her, sometimes you take the money and you run. And, you know, that was the best I could do. But I, I know that uh, I've, it's come back to me through another channel that she had a bit of a wake up call. So I'm, I'm using this as an example because it was just full on morality play. Can yeah. I just jump on to that? And then I know, Zena, you wanted to say something. But when you talk about morality plays, one of my other pet peeves, which uh, I think Stephanie isn't on the call anymore, but uh, now that you're asking about my pet peeves, here's another one is um, in our popular culture, it seems as if so much of our entertainment are these simple stories of heroes and villains. And um, you have the good guys and the bad guys and the good guys are in jeopardy and then they finally prevail. And for some reason, so much of at least American public just can't get enough of these stories, these simplistic stories and these morality plays. And in some ways, although this may be in an action movie that has nothing to do with, with divorce, um, I think that mindset of good and bad, right and wrong may just per, you know, pervade so much of the way people think and feel. Mm. Yeah, so Andre, I, th I, I agree with Bill that, that we don't want to leave it to the people because the people would fight it out. <laughs> and I, I think that the hope was that lawyers and the legal system would civilize people and bring them into sort of a narrower mode that then they could resolve the problems. And I think that hasn't worked. <laughs> so maybe we need to find a different profession to try to civilize people. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, one of the things that, that this book, this litigation interest and risk assessment book, is oriented to is to essentially try to help sort of have a mutual conversation of uh, between lawyers and clients and have the lawyers help clients essentially be counselors you know lawyers are supposed to be counselors at law to have them reflect on what their expectations are and what their desires are and to help them make better decisions now Part of the problem is that lawyers aren't very good at this to begin with, but the goal is to try and move them in that direction. Um, you know, and, and it's along the lines of, I think, what you're talking about, or what the, Zena, about what the, the hope was that lawyers would help civilize um, parties or mediators would. Um, yeah. Certainly, it's not worked here. It really hasn't. And... Um, you know, it, I, I, there's all sorts of reasons not helped by the pandemic, 
but uh, the government really wants everyone to go to mediation in family work at least and it's just you know to the point where they're funding it and um to an extent not fully uh it's just not working and i i just feel there is also another strand within this particularly and i don't know how much it applies to other kinds of work but certainly in family work there is a strand where people feel they have to go to court to show they have done everything they possibly can so they can say to the child or children when they grow up, this is what I did to stop, to stop this. It's almost like it's a test of their own morality that they have to pursue things. Uh, not all of them, of course, by any, but there is definitely, in my experience, that strand happens as well. And, and I think that when you get to that sort of situation, it, they're living with their own, you know, it's their face, it's their whole um, interaction, it's their legacy of what they tried to do, and it, and it may well be justified. You know, if you've got a, a, an intransigent parent on the other side, I think it's terribly complicated, but I would agree absolutely we need a much deeper understanding. I mean, the whole thing about law uh, mediation being the practice of law is nonsense. It's the practice of psychology, I believe. And you've got to know the law, but really, it's the psychology. And so I think I'm an unauthorized practice practitioner of psychology. <laughs> <laughs> John, you, go ahead. You, you've been you've been very gracious to us, and um, I have missed two meetings already. I, sh I should not miss the third one. <laughs> <laughs> and you're the last one here. I, I want to thank you for coming in and for, for your terrific talk. And you can see from the comments how people loved it. And and um, and you can see people still wanna to talk to you uh, even though we are 15 minutes over. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. And um, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll keep in touch. Thank you, John. Thank you. I enjoyed it. This was thank really good conversation. Bye-bye everybody. Bye, thank you. I will end this call, talk call now. Thank you. Great to see you, John. Good to see you too, Zena.